Combining futures and options on futures involves substantial risk of loss and is not suitable for all traders and investors. Oftentimes in futures trading, you have a high combination of leverage and volatility. And although this could be an equation for opportunity, it's also an equation for risk. So be careful, only fund your futures trading account with risk capital. My personal definition of risk capital is money I could afford to lose, doesn't change my lifestyle, or overly stress me out. As human beings, we make bad decisions when we're under stress, so be in a good spot. Remember, micro contracts could be friends. Take it easy on the day trade margins. You get plenty of leverage without maxing out on those day trade margins on a regular basis. We'll be taking a look at a real-time simulated live NinjaTrader trading platform today, and none of this should be construed as trade or investment advice. Past performance not indicative of future results. Well, good afternoon, good evening, and welcome to Traders Workshop. I'll be your host, Tom Schneider, CMT with Ninja Trader. And before I introduce our next guest, it's a repeat guest. We love having him back on. I do want to encourage you, the viewer, to join the chat, join the community by going to ninjatrader.com slash events, E-V-E-N-T-S, and hit that big old play button. That'll pop up a chat window. You can drop in questions for our next guest because there will be a Q&A session well into the into the presentation. So uh, remember, ninjatrader.com slash events to join the chat. And with that out of the way, I do want to welcome back our, our very esteemed guests, uh, Ninja Trader ecosystem partner and renowned author, Larry Williams. How you doing, Larry? Hey, good, Tom. Thanks for having me. As always, it's a joy to you know, in my life, I don't get to be around traders very much. So this is really nice to be part of the trading community, even though we're just uh, we're all separated by Internet and all that. But it's really nice. This is my family. This is what we do. This is my life. So it's great, great to be here. Thank you. Well, we you know, we we really are thankful to you to to come in and, and you know, talk to us. Um, Jim and I talk on our shows and certainly Mike as well, that sometimes trading isn't exactly uh the most gregarious or the most uh, crowded type of job, right? You're sitting in a in your office, possibly alone, right? You don't see people for minutes or hours at a time. So it's great to have you on and come on and talk and talk to other traders and and maybe build a little bit of a community uh, like we try to do here at Ninja Trader. Well, you know, as an aside on that, there's an important point I want to make. I recall this so vividly years ago. I was in the midst of a trade. And if you're trading at home, you're right. It's just you in front of a screen. So I was like this in front of my screen. And people looking into the room say, well, he's not working. He's surfing the internet or whatever. And they will come in and interrupt your day, even though you're right in the midst of a really important trade, because it doesn't look to them as looking in like you're really working. So if you're going to trade from home or in that one-on-one -on -one space, you need to have a rule. Like it, you, you don't cross this barrier or you wave and then I can acknowledge you, but don't, I'm not being personally, I'm not rejecting you, but it, I am actually working when I'm just sitting like this at the screen. So don't bother me unless we have some way of identifying that it's safe for safe space for you to come in now. Really important because it can break up your concentration. And it always seems to happen. We're in the midst of a trade. I don't know why, but that's the way the world works. Well, Larry, I'm going to have my 11 year old watch this because <laughs> The same reason I can't have him running in while we're having a show. He 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 only wants to bother me when the lights on and I'm on the camera. So I'm going to have him watch that bit of advice from you. Thanks for that. Great. So uh, we have a great topic today. It's um, you know I think something that you have a uh, great experience in, and we've talked about it kind of uh, as an aside or or as a small part on previous shows. But I thought this is the perfect time of year to uh, uh, make this a focus of a show. And that's seasonality. So, you know, what are your thoughts on seasonality and what's the importance of seasonality to you, Larry? The importance of seasonality is it gives us a view of how the markets have usually traded, how they've traded on balance, on average in the past. It doesn't mean they'll do it exactly the same this year, but we know that there's a bias in the market to rally or decline at certain times of the year. So that really highlights an occasion for us to focus on the market and say, you know, usually stocks rally right now in October. So I'm really focused on stocks. I'm heavily long stocks, as a matter of fact, because of seasonality. So to me, seasonality is not a guarantee of success by any means, but it's a time to focus so you can bring into play your other technical or fundamental tools. It's a great conditional setup for the marketplace 
a, a time to really be alert instead of falling asleep. Now I'm really alert. There's a couple of markups I'll talk about today. They're also in that zone right now where seemingly usually something happens and that's all I want. I want to have a bias in the marketplace. And if I can get that from seasonality or commitment trade report or whatever, great. Because then I know I'm way out of the other traders because I have a view of the future they don't have. Oh, yeah, for sure. I I, I really like that. And, you know, there are, of course, different ways to look at seasonality, um, you know, through charts, through data. Um, so I'm, you know, I'm really interested to hear what you have to say. My experience has always been through building charts or creating charts, you know, taking requests from traders like you and saying, how can I do this? But you get so many different views. Uh, you know, somebody with your experience, I'd love to hear and love to see what you have to show. Let's do it. Yeah, let's go. Okay, let's start. Uh, first, though, you know, this is dangerous. Seasonal don't always work. They're not a guarantee. If you've read all the disclaimers, we'll read them again, because this really is dangerous what we do. You can lose money doing this. Uh, I'm in two, three trades right now. One's losing and one's in two are ahead. So it does not mean that every trade is going to work. It's just, you know, this is a tough business, guys and gals. And if that may not be for you. So really consider what these disclaimers say. Um, I, I, some of you don't know who Bob Wills is, but this, look who this is, Mick Jagger. And he's, you know, he's a rock and roll, the Rolling Stones, right? And he's singing a song about Bob Wills is still the king. Now that's a song that was made popular by Willie Nelson and Waylon Jennings and Johnny Cash because they said that in Texas, in Texas music, Bob Wills is still the king. Uh, isn't that amazing that somebody of Mick Jagger's st uh, status will give full credit to somebody else? So as I start seasonals, I want to give full credit to Yale Hirsch. Yale and I first met somewhere in the late 1960s, early 1970s. That's his son there on the left. I first met Jeff when he was about six years old. They came to our summer home in Montana, and I showed Jeff how to fish. First trouty, first fish he ever caught was uh, on the lake where I lived. Yale's passed away now, but Yale really was one of the founding fathers of seasonality. So Bob Wales is still the king of uh, country western music in Texas. And we certainly have to acknowledge Yale Hirsch because he did so much work on seasonality. There's his 1973 Stock Traders Almanac. And he talked about the January barometer way back then. If you look a little bit further, there's, oh, Larry Williams on investment strategy. So Yale and I go way back. It's been a long journey to learn about seasonals. At one point, I thought they were the be all end all. I found out they really weren't. I wrote a book, Sure Thing Commodity Trading, How Seasonal Factors Influence Commodity Prices in 1973. That was the first book, to my knowledge, ever written on how seasonal influences take place in the commodity market. Uh, nobody had written anything about it before, little things here and there, but in terms of a book with all the market, that was it. So I think I can fairly say I've been using uh, or abusing seasonality longer than anybody else in terms of future market. In addition to Yale, there's some other people that have done interesting seasonality work. Philip Berkeley, really hard to get find his stuff. Jake Bernstein, my dear friend, and Frank Tauscher, who passed away a while ago. Steve Moore. There's other people who've worked on seasonality as well, and they should be acknowledged. Um, there's some basic questions, though, that I always get asked. So I thought, I'm going to answer these right here, right now. Are they better in some markets than others? And not really. Um, I'm going to show you how you can make them better in one market than you probably used them in the past. But remember, because all the seasonal influence does, is look at how this market is traded in the past. It, so on average, this is true of whatever market we're looking at. It usually is rallied or declined at this time period. So which one is the most reliable? I don't think I, if I could, it, it would be an easy game to say, well, this one is always reliable. It isn't an easy game. It's still the art of trading. Um, how many years of data do I need? I get asked that question a lot. Probably need at least 10 years of data to get a true seasonal pattern of what's going on in the marketplace. You need to have at least 10 years of data. And then that's going to give you enough information. You can make some pretty good informed judgments on what should happen. So there's some errors that I've made in the path I'd like to talk about it. When I wrote that book in 1973, I made a huge error, and that mathematical error, and that error has been picked up by everybody ever since. If you look at the current seasonal 
today, it looks just the same way it did 80 years ago. Because what I did and what everybody else has done is they took all the seasonal data up to today, made the pattern using all of, say, the last 100 years of data, and then took that pattern and moved it back in time. But it was using data out of sample to do that. So what we have in Ninja Trader is what I call my true seasonal. We only use data up to the point we have right now. And that is really important. I'm going to show you why that's important. Um, because you're using out of sample data. If you're if you think that the seasonal tendency of the stock market in 1930 was the same as now, you're, you're using data from then up to now. Well, it's not a real view of what was going on at that time. This is the big thing. I've repeated this and repeated it again. All that a seasonal study does is show you on average how prices have traded. There's no guarantee it's going to do that in the future, but on average, this is what usually happens. Not always, but usually. So if we know what usually happens, we can see how the market is responding to what it usually does. And that's the real value of seasonality. Seasonals are just a pattern of past behavior. And like anybody's past behavior, their future behavior may differ, right? If you have children, you know that. So just keep that in mind as you look at them. Well, let's look at what I was just talking about. You've probably heard if you've been in the stock market for a year or two, sell in May and go away. That was a big stock market slogan, sell in May and go away. And there we can see the Dow Jones Industrial Average in 2019, you want to sell in May and go away. Prices don't go very far. That's the seasonal pattern. That's not quite reality though. If you go back to 1935, you wanted to buy in May and make some hay. The seasonal pattern was different back then. And that's where our true seasonal pattern, this shows the true seasonal pattern in 1935, everybody else will show this pattern in 1935 because they take all the current data and push it back in time. So when you're learning, studying, using seasonal patterns, if you're using the traditional approach, you're not gonna pick up things like this, that there is a change or a shift in seasonality. So this is the important thing as I see it, seasonals are an alert, they're a confirmation tool, they're a focus like, okay, right now, I really need to pay attention to this market as opposed to that market, because usually this market has substantial rallies or declines. Most often, as you know, if you've traded much, markets go back and forth and back and forth, and they have big moves. These big moves usually, not always, take place in conjunction with the seasonal time periods. So it just helps us get out of the forest and find an individual tree to try to chop down. I want to talk about a great voice from the tomb. You may have heard of this. This is really old logic, you aren't aware of it. Years ago, there was a really wealthy uh, Chicago Board of Trade member, pit trader. And uh, when the kids came to get all the money that they thought he had, they, the lawyer just gave him a slip of paper and it said, buy wheat in May and sell wheat in July or whatever. He didn't give them any money at all. He just gave them some seasonal trades in the marketplace called Voice from the Tomb. Well, if we go back to that, and this has been around, I remember reading Voice from the Tomb uh, when I was starting in the 1960s, early 1960s. And the Voice from the Tomb said, sell wheat, March wheat on January 10th. The other thing that he gave his children, right, was, by May and or July wheat, February 22nd. Sell wheat on May 10th. So what we're seeing from the voice of the tomb is very specific, do this on this date. That's been generally carried forward by most seasonal people, including myself, because we got into the voice from the tomb as very specific, very mechanical, da 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 I've moved away from that, and I'll show you how I've moved away from that. Here's the true wheat seasonal pattern. Now notice that the voice from the tomb said, uh, sell March wheat on January 10th. So if we look in January 10th, uh, usually right around here, wheat has started to decline, not every year, however, but that's the voice from the tomb. Here is a seasonal pattern. And notice that it changes. What it is right now isn't quite what it was a few years ago because we have more data. This is what we know at this point. This is the pattern we knew with data from just here backwards. But it tells us that, generally speaking, we see rallies in the July timeframe. That September, July timeframe is when we usually get the big rallies. So that can help 
do what I talked about, focus on the market. Now, if we look at those voice from the tune signal, I pulled those up and put them on a Ninja Trader chart. There was a sell. That's the first sell you saw. Mm, not so good. The buy wasn't so good. That sell was pretty good. This buy was pretty good. And the sell over here wasn't so good. So don't just copy the voice from the tune. Uh, the kids probably would have appreciated if they'd got cash instead of uh, dates to buy and sell wheat uh, and corn. But there's still some validity in this. And what's interesting, the voice from the tune were my book written in 1973, 40 some years ago, 50 years ago, still has some value to it. Um, by July corn on March 1st. And if we look at my book, we also gave specifics in that book. By week, the second trading day of October. Wow, that's where we are. Right here, right now. We better look at that chart. Sell February 27th, sell March 15th, and buy on June 15th. And corn trade by October 4th. Whoa, look, we're real close to this one too. So this means, this is what I talk about. We can focus on these two markets right now to see what's going on. So we look at the, what's happened in October corn. This is from 1972. This is the date we're supposed to buy. It was right after low. Now, it's not always that way. But it gives us an idea that though this work was done years ago, some of these things have held up. This is where we are right now in the December corn contract. And we're looking for that buy. Remember, we go back to the buy on October 5th, 14th, right? So October 14th is coming up over here. And notice how the seasonal pattern kind of pulls down and kicks up. So this is the time frame. If you're a grain trader, you really want to focus on this market because usually, and not always, but usually corn has rallied at this time frame. So when you get into that zone, then you can bring in whatever you're using, Elliott waves, outer case, upper Mongolian flying boxcars, trend line, whatever your thing is, you can use it that time frame to either get in the trade or confirm that, yeah, this year the seasonal is probably going to work. So that's how I can actually look ahead and say, okay, if I'm a corn guy, I, I'm going to focus on corn around the middle of October here because typically and usually, We've rallied at that time frame. Soybean meal is interesting. Look where the soybean meal is right now. We're right at a seasonal low in this market. And I'm long. Uh, I went long in this time frame over here because we based and the, the whirly gigs that I follow in the marketplace gave some trend chain buy signals in here. So that coupled with that we usually rally this time of year was a reason for me to be long soybean meal. What's nice about this is I know where my stop, I like if we make new lows, I've got to pitch a trade and admit defeat again. I admit defeat often, by the way. It's a really great talent to be able to admit defeat earlier. The sooner you get out of a bad trade, better it is. Most people really don't make money because they hold on to the losing trades too long and they get out of their winning trades too quick. So I try to do the opposite. I know my fail points right down here. It gets, I'm out, I'm wrong. And the sooner you learn to admit defeat in this market, I think the better trader you're gonna become. But again, you see how we can focus like, oh, now I can look at commitment of trade reporting, which is bullish and soybean meal. You can look at accumulation or whatever tools you have to confirm this year, probably the seasonal pattern will work. Notice also that the seasonal pattern is really lower here than here by quite a bit. This year, we're lower. We're following the seasonal pattern. I'd like to see prices higher here than here, which would mean they're stronger than the seasonal pattern, which is usually lower here than over here. So that's another little tipping point for you. So let's talk about the do nots of seasonal trading. Do not base a trade on just on seasonals. Uh, I'm in my soybean meal trade for a couple of reasons not just seasonal, seasonal were a highlight at this time frame. Don't think price is gonna follow exactly the same pattern um, and don't trade it blind. Look at what price is really actually doing in the marketplace um, and really kind of a reiteration, don't fall in love with mechanical dates. I'm gonna show you some mechanical signals in a little bit and everybody loves these buy on this date on the opening. That's not how I trade it. 
we use the computer to bring out when there are advantages in the marketplace. And a computer, it, it, it's got to buy in this state. It can't be like, well, let's buy if this is happening or not if this is happening. If it's renting Chicago, it can't do that. It has to be precise. So I'm using these precise dates as a time to focus and use the art of trading, my ability as a trader, to try to profit from that seasonal pattern. That's how I use seasonal trading. Uh, I don't know if we've got any questions that have come in yet, but if yep. so, um, probably a good time to try to answer a few of them. Right. So uh, thanks for that explanation. And what I, what I just want to, what hit me while you were talking about that, Larry, is it's another alert of sorts that's not typical when you're looking at charts, right? It's it's time-based. It's a calendar. So, but you, but like you said, you can't make it the uh, driving force of a trade. It's almost like a heads up. Hey, this is what uh, history has, has told us that this is the trend generally on average this should be our our it's time right now it's not time necessarily maybe another it's, thing it's, it's two, it's but two it's time things. to look at it, right it, it's it's it can be timing this is generally when we usually rally and it can be magnitude because we look at some of those charts let's go back and look at a couple we see in the soybean meal chart well in this time frame not much happens right so i'm looking for magnitude where do yep. we usually get magnitude moves so i can get some idea we usually get the larger moves here and at this time. So it can be magnitude and it can be focused. Now, the big error we made when we first stumbled into this with computers, uh, we researched and found that uh, in uh, 15 of the last 16 years, wheat rallied on this date. So we all fell in love with this mechanical trading approach because we could make it perfect for the past, but uh, the past is never the future. The future is always varies from the past. So. That's where we finally figured out, no, it's a tool. It's not a buy on this date, sell on this date. That's a mechanical approach. It may work, but probably better to use it as a tool. Yep. Thanks for that. So we do have some questions coming in. Um, I th I'm going to go with the most topical, not the first one, but Eddie, Eddie chimed in. And his question is, how do you think geopolitical tensions affect seasonal patterns? Well, uh, I'll wander off that point for just a moment. I don't think that geopolitical stuff like what's happening right now in Israel has any bearing on the long-term direction of the market. It probably flies in the face of what a lot of people think. I think markets have long-term cyclical, almost predestined patterns or waves that they're going to follow. This is just part of the big picture. However, when it comes to seasonality, that's a little different because, sure, things can be accentuated, by seasonals because of current crop failures, news events in the marketplace. So while cycles, I think, are pretty much predestined, uh, the seasonals are different. So you need to bifurcate those. Seasonals will be affected by this year's crop is different than last year's crop. Or now we might see a heavy use of, of grain supply wanted in Israel or energy prices. So the news will affect the seasonals, whereas the long-term cyclicals, I don't think, are I think the news is already forecast by the long-term cycles. Great. Thanks for that. Um, well, I'm going to save this question because I think it goes into possibly a later topic. But uh, Carol asks, uh, hi, Larry, after breaking all-time highs, will the next pullback drop below September lows? What market are we talking about? I'm going to assume the E-mini S&P, seeing as that's what a lot of our traders focus on. Well, I think that we will see all-time highs in the S&P somewhere in this coming year. Uh, so I'm I'm still bullish. I don't have any reason to be bearish. It's exactly how high it will go, where it will pull back. Carol, I'm not that good. I apologize. I can't predict that. I just know that the long term, we're still in a really bullish bias market. And you want to buy big breaks in bull markets and sell big rallies. The exact points along the way, uh, I'm not good enough to do that. I, I'm sorry. No, I just, I'm not. Uh, another question from, uh, I'm assuming, uh, da well, Dav McD says, do technical and precious metals follow seasonal patterns to your points of view? Well, sure. I think you'll find a seasonal pattern in almost all markets. Gold has a seasonal pattern. Does it always follow the seasonal pattern? No. This year it didn't. 
That's why you still need to bring in timing tools. So uh, like right now, I'm in a seasonal low for soybean meal. I still need a trend change to take place that says, yeah, the market's, it, it's got it. It's going to follow the seasonal pattern this year. I need some further confirmation from the market right here, right now to confirm that probably the seasonal will work this year. So that's like I said, you got to tie these things together. Like, okay, I'm on alert. Seasonal pattern says this usually happens, but I still have to bring in some other things take some other arrows out of my quiver to shoot this market down. Uh, another question, FHS Austria asks, how about astrological data? You know, I looked at astrological data years ago. I had a couple of books on it. Wow, it was over my head. The conjunctions and all these things, I, 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 I can't figure it out. So I don't know anything about astrology. I do think that there's a lunar influence on stock prices. I mean, that's confirmed. There's an interesting paper by Atlanta Federal Reserve System on the influence, and also the University of Michigan, a paper on the influence of lunar uh, dates and stock prices. Not enough to be profitable traded, but there is some influence. Other than that, I don't know anything about astrology. It's, it's way too complex for me. I'm not, I'm not really good with all the details. I don't get it, frankly. Uh, let's talk. There are a couple more, Larry. So I just I just want to get through these. Uh, Oleg asks, uh, "Hi, Larry. Thoughts on unprofitable small cap stocks in this bull market?" Well, uh, you know I, that doesn't get to seasonality, so I don't know. I just know that in bull markets, the stocks you really want to own to own for the least drawdown are are value stocks. The ones that may go up the most are the momentum or growth stocks, but when they break, they break real badly. So as a long-term investor, you look at the really great successes, the value investors have outperformed the growth investors. And that's been true for many, many years. So that's the only comment I would have on that. Well, sorry. Uh, let's go with, uh, well, first of all, uh, Dav McTee also says your Williams percent R is still the king. Uh, and thank you to Larry Williams for that. So that was more of a comment. Um, here's a question uh, from MC. Is the Santa Claus rally really a thing? Well, uh, yes, the Santa Claus rally is a bias in the marketplace. It doesn't take place every year, but most of the time it does. So if I can have an advantage in the game, I know something other people don't know, I can be alert to that happening this year. Uh, just like until a few moments ago, you had no idea that corn usually rallies around the middle of October, did you? So right. now you're one step ahead of the rest of the traders in the marketplace. It gives you an advantage in the game. Uh, that's all that it gives you. Um, so sure, it's been there. It's been proven. It's held up for many years. Every year? No, not every year. But it, is it something we can try to take advantage of? Oh, absolutely. Uh, one more. Well, let's do uh, one more about mindset. Deanna asks, how does she overcome the mindset of it will come back? And she ties it into seasonal seasonal uh, uh, trading um, <clears throat> because this could happen in a seasonal trade. Uh, but how how could you overcome that mindset knowing what's happening with the seasonal if it doesn't go with what the seasonal is doing? And I think you answered it before with your your taking uh, you know keeping a stop that's appropriate. But well, to, to get into the mindset, I like to share this with people. I think that beliefs will kill you. So and we all believe what we want to believe. We want to believe this year the seasonal will work. We want to believe this trade will make money. My belief system is this trade will lose. And that's a very empowering belief system because if I believe that this trade will lose, I'm really careful with it, aren't I? And most traders are so optimistic, they believe and they want to believe this trade will work. They forget stops and they think, oh, it will come back because I don't know why. You think God really wants your position to come back? No, probably not. So uh, to me, I'm, I'm wrong. I'm, I get out of a deal. It may come back. I don't care if it comes back. I was wrong. It, it didn't do what it should have done. So false belief systems, almost any belief system, you got to be really careful of. So if I believe, I, my, I'm i going to believe the trade's not going to work. And that way I will manage a trade a lot better 
than somebody with the belief system that, oh, this is going to work. Right? That's not my belief system. Great. I think, um, Larry, let's let's continue on with the presentation. Great. And we'll, we will have time at the end to have a couple more questions, I think. Okay. Um, we are doing uh, my next feature course. So if you want to learn more about that, those who are asking questions stuff, you can go to iReallyTrade.com. That's a website because at 81 years of age, I still really trade, still really do this stuff. Uh, okay, let's look at the 30-year pattern in the bond market. So this would be pretty apparent. Here's the seasonal pattern of how bonds have usually traded year in and year out. And they're pretty well following the down move this year. And look what usually happens in October. Uh, we usually start to come down right around the 1st of October. So we have a general path that this market may or may not follow. We know it usually has followed this path. So how do we take advantage of that? And uh, this is the path, right? We usually decline. So good. Now let's get a little more specific here, Williams. Let's try to see if we can make some money out of that. So one way I do that is by look at what happened if we sold on the first trading day, second trading day, third trading day, fifth trading day, et cetera, of the bond market in October. Why are we selling in October? Well, that's why the seasonal pattern way to the downside in October. And I see that the first couple of three days, like, whoa, look at that, 85, 90% accuracy, lots of money has been made buying and getting out in a couple of days. This is a two or three day trade. Uh, in the last 21 years, I've well, we got a lot of time period to look at that. Then we see as we get a little further down here around the 15th, 16th, selling doesn't make money. And then if we get 23 trading days right at the very end, that last trading day looks like it may have some profits in it. So then I can get very specific. Oh, right around the first and second trading day of, uh, of October, I want to look to be a seller. Well, that's the first trading day of October and we went down with like one, two, three, four, four down days in the market. Uh, that's about a $2,000 trade in there. So that's actual application. Uh, notice that this chart was prior to uh, October unfolding. This I did this a um, few days ago to get ready for the power presentation, did this, and then, well, this is what actually happened this year. So we get a pretty good idea of how we can put this into application. I focus on this time period, pretty simple. Well, gee, we know we're bearish at this time frame. I take out the prior day's low. I could have been an entry there, whatever your entry techniques are. We're in a downtrend. We're following the seasonal pattern. Oh, good. That's the way it should be happening. Uh, what if we buy bonds in October? Well, look what happens if we buy bonds in October. Well, we don't do very well at all. There's only way down here, the 20th trading day of the month. We make $5,000. But if we look over here and look at the maximum winning trade, that was for $5,000. So one winning trade made all the money. It doesn't look like there's a lot of short-term pops to the upside in the bond market in October. So that gives me a, a view. And all I want is a view of the future. It doesn't have to be a perfect view, but most people trading the bond market right now don't have this view. They don't understand that this is what usually happens. And they probably want to wait till maybe the middle of November for the bond market to rally. There'll be a lot of bottom pickers in this bond market. Not We're not there yet based on some other things I do as well as the seasonal pattern. So that's really putting it into direct application. So let's talk about the stock market. This is what usually happens in the stock market. You know, this year, we're following what usually happens in the stock market. We usually start to come down around the 1st of October. We start to come up. That's what's usually happen. Does it always happen? No. But look at this little red circle line right here. See where it's red, that little circle? Usually prices burn up right at the end of October. I'll tell you a little bit about this. Uh, many years ago, I did uh, trading seminars where I traded $1 million real time. And we gave people that came to the seminar 20% of the profits. In about 13 seminars, we made a million dollars. We gave back over $200,000 of profits to people that came to the seminars. This was real time. This is real money. Uh, and I always held the, at least one of the seminars right over here in this red time period, right around the 19th trading day left in October. So if I'm doing a real-time trading seminar where I'm investing trading a lot of money, 
check the calendar date. I did it for a reason. We did those seminars in October for a reason. Stocks, you not always, but stocks usually rally strongly at the end of October. So that's how we actually use this strategy. Crude oil, we're going to look at stocks again in a moment, but crude oil also has been a lot of comments about crude oil. Crude oil starts to top, top out, a little bit of a rally left, and then, uh-oh, it moves to the downside. So again, we have some visibility. Are we acting stronger or weaker? Notice that crude oil in here was stronger than the seasonal pattern. Uh, seasonal pattern was lower here, lower down here than up here. So yeah, we get some strength in the market. So that's how I use it. Speaking of crude oil, let's talk about crude oil stocks for a moment. I thought you might like this. This is not seasonal, but it's pretty interesting. The red line is crude oil pushed forward. So this potential decline that we saw in here was known quite a while in advance. In fact, I'm going to show you in a moment. So in other words, my thinking is that crude oil could be a leading indicator for the stock market. By how much of a leading indicator? Buy something about like that. So this is where we are now. Stocks have kind of followed what crude oil has done. We should be in this phase right now of the relationship of crude oil to stock prices. So that's uh, another indication, I think, that what we're seeing in this seasonal sweet spot in the S&Ps could be a really good point this year. So as I come into that, end of this month, I'm, I'm already long this market um, heavily, but I will again look at the end of the month to see as we get there, where's my percent R, where's on balance volume, where's all the indicators that we offer to our students that are available in Ninja, how are these forming up right now? I also know at this time, the commitment to trade reports were incredibly bullish. I was on Jim Cramer's Mad Money last night with that that there's a lot of bullishness in the market now. So given that there's bullishness in the market, then the seasonal pattern, the seasonal on average, what should happen, I think we have a better shot at it this year than just any other random year. It looks like it's coming together. Um, that's the way um, I see this stuff at, at this point. Um, more questions have come in, Tom? What's uh, how we doing there? Yeah, exactly. So. Uh, Paulie H., he's one of our regular viewers on our bookend shows, uh, Hi, Opening Paulie. Range and Bars Closing. Paulie's a great, uh, uh, consistent viewer, and he has a question uh, about silver. So I don't know if you have any charts uh, or, or if you've looked at silver recently, but he's just asking if it's getting close to a seasonal low. Here's the big thing in silver right now, Paul. We're going to really pay close attention to this. Look at copper, silver, and gold. They've all been trading pretty much the same, but one of those markets has been stronger. So when you get into the seasonal low for the precious metals, really focus, gold has been weaker than silver. Like that'll give you a little hint right there, right? So these markets are all in a family. And as they get into a family and getting into a seasonal low, like the typically grain rally at this time of the year, well, wheat hasn't been as strong as corn or soybeans or whatever. Soybeans have not been as strong as soybean meal. So when I get into that, I don't have the chart in front of me, so I, I don't, I can't say right now what the seasonal pattern is, but it's there in Ninja, um, and you can say, okay, as I get into that seasonal low, as we talked about earlier, that's a focus point. Okay, what family member has been the strongest, which is held up against the selling the best? That's the one you're going to want to trade. In terms of my longer term view of gold, I don't think we're at a low yet. Um, a really interesting year uh, in gold because. My gosh, you've listened to all the talk show radio guys. Gold should have gone to the moon this year because of Joe Biden and liberalism and no Donald Trump and deficit and whatever, and gold didn't. So it just shows that gold is driven by something other than what you think it's driven by. Gold is driven by the commitment to trade by the large users and producers of gold. That's why I think drives the gold market and all this cycle babble political stuff. It's really interesting to hear for it. I fall for more conspiracies, probably anybody else will. But the reality is gold is a commodity. It has booms. It has busts. And you do better to pay attention to your charts and the driving forces as opposed to Sean Hannity or the radio talk show uh, people. Thanks for that. Um, Paulie has a follow-up question. Uh, do you use election cycles, mentioning politics, 
election cycles factor into your your seasonality. Absolutely. There's a great election trade. I'll give you it right here, right now. You want to buy stocks before the election next year, about four days before the election. There's a good seasonal trade. I mean, my gosh, that's been, I don't, can't give you the numbers right off the top of my head, but it's probably about 85, 90% of the time, stocks rally strongly starting a couple of days before the election till the day after the election. Why? I think we're just so happy to get rid of the political advertising. We don't care what dirty dog we elect, and it doesn't seem to matter. Stocks almost always rally. But don't take my word for this. You go back and look at your charts every four years in November, see what happened. See how you would have traded that. That's how you can learn how to use my seasonal approach to the market. And I do think there is a presidential cycle. About every four years, the markets trade pretty much as they have in the past. But that's just one of the dominant cycles. That's one important cycle. I don't think it's the most important longer term cycle, but it's one that I sure look at. You bet I do. Thanks for that. That's a great answer. Um, <clears throat> FHS Austria asks, is corn leading the commodities? I don't know, and I haven't looked at it, so okay. I can't answer that. I'm sorry. Um, question from Barry G. This is specifically about your BT dome, BT depth of market. Are you going to release it for NinjaTrader? Is it being developed for NinjaTrader? Do you know about that? My my what? Your BT Dome? I don't know what BT Dome is, but that's what the question is about. I don't know, but maybe we better go create it so we can release that. I don't know what it is. Let's so trade market. That, that seems like yeah, it's resonating. Some, somebody else's work, not mine. Okay. And then um, Jim asks, how do you generally set stop loss levels? Is it a fixed percentage or is it based on the chart, what the chart's telling you? Um, uh, two ways I support, I do stop losses. Um, first of all, I know that in the actively traded markets like treasury bonds, a $1,600 stop per contract has been really good. And the S&P is $2,200. has been a really good stop. It's held up for years. So I will look at that. Uh, um, I don't do a percentage of risk because I don't, I don't think that really relates to the markets. I know from testing that that $1,600 and $2,200 stuff, those have really held up really well for a long time frame. And it'll look like we're looking at uh, a chart of the S&Ps here. I think that's what we're looking at, right? Yeah, the Dow. So if we take out this low, I've got to admit that I'm wrong. So yeah, I will I will look at chart points. Of, I got long well, I got long back over in here. And I actually held this trade. I did a lot of buying in here. And held that trade until up over here. I got out, I think, on this day right here. So I missed the top by a lot. But I sat through all that. So most people would have been stopped out. But that to me was a long-term position. That I treat very different than I'm buying here and getting out in a couple of days. In this case, my stop was way down here. And I didn't care that we had to pull back because I believe we were going to have a rally until this time frame and finally got out up here. So, and that, in fact, that's exactly how I got out. And um, uh, now I'm back in. Uh, so it depends if you're in a very short-term trade, then you have to have a really relatively close stop right underneath the recent lows or a dollar risk of generally the amounts they gave you. Uh, but if you're in a long-term position trade, that's very different. Warren Buffett doesn't use stops. And in a long-term trade, my stop is be a, a substantially different than in a short-term trade. I hope that gives you a little understanding of at least what I do. That's great. Um, I, Larry, I got a little clarification, and I assume something, depth of market. No, we were talking about day of month, best trading day of month. Oh, day, day of month. Oh, day of month. I know you uh, know all about that. Uh, yeah, I do know a little bit about trading day of month. Well, working on that, we'll see. I don't know what we're going to do. We we haven't done that publicly any other place, any place at all anymore. So I don't know. This is because then people... When they see my trading day of the month stuff, Tom, then I get emails. Well, should I buy in the morning or in the afternoon session, the opening session, which contract? I get so many emails as is. I don't want any more emails. So we just we just stop doing that. So here's some general time frames for you. And I, uh, too many emails. Um, so I don't know if we're going to do it or not. If okay. so, we'll let you know. It's not, it's not on the front of the burner right now. I'll tell you that much for sure. Well, thanks for that, Larry. Um, anything you want to close with, especially... You know, I think uh, how people can get, get a hold of you 
and you know maybe you want to just talk about your your course again. Sure. Um, uh, this is a course that we've done for quite a few people. Uh, the indicator is a program for Ninja Trader, and they come for free with the cost of the course. And you know, I saw I was on the line online today. Some guys charging fifteen thousand dollars for an online course. I got this is crazy. Right? Ours is a couple thousand dollars. If not, I don't know if it's even that much. Like the prices are so absurd for what people are charging. And they, I've been doing this for sixty years. I got a track record. I won trading championships. My students have won trading championships. So if you're going to look any place, you're not saying that I'm for you, but I will tell you this, when it comes to learning about the markets, this is what I think you should do. You should listen to everybody, as Ronald Reagan said, trust but verify. And when you find somebody that you kind of like this person, listen to them for a while and see if you easily understand what they say. Do you quickly get it? If so, that probably should be your teacher. If it's confusing for you, and you're like, what is he saying? I don't quite get that. If that's the way my stuff is to you, then I am not for you at all. You want to find the teacher where you absorb their ideas pretty quickly. You get where they're coming from. That way, you're going to have a teacher that you can work with. So that's probably more important than the course material. Like, is this somebody you can work with? That's what you're really looking for. Um, and that may or may not be me. I mean, there's a lot of, there's some really good people out there that do a lot of, of other stuff, but we do have ours and, and you can go to iReadyTrade.com um, and uh, find out more about it. Well, Larry, that's great advice. And I think that's the great thing about being a trader is you can actually shop for a teacher, right? I think of my, my son who's going to college, my daughters who's going to college, and they may like their professor, they may not, but they have to take that same course. You as a trader learning, you can you can shop around and find someone who resonates with you. I think those are great words. Yeah, some people will naturally want a mathematical approach. They'll want moving average. Some will want astrology. Some will want whatever. And it, it, you kind of have to follow your heart and your mind, how your mind works. And that's where you're going to learn the most. Like, there's a lot of things I don't think works. But I don't just don't, my mind doesn't grab Elliott Wave as an example or didn't grab astrology I mentioned. Or maybe your mind does. I don't know. I don't know if it works or not. But you have to find something, I think, where you say, yeah, I got it. I mean, that's how, when I was in college, I didn't have a like, horrible grades. And I, probably I wasn't the smartest guy in the class for one thing, but also I had no interest in the subject. And then I did have some class. I love the subject. I really understood it. So I got really good grades in those classes. Same thing with learning markets. Well, Larry, thank you so much for taking the time to sit with us and talk seasonality. And, you know, taking questions, I thought that was great. I appreciate it. And, you know, as always, come back anytime. I appreciate that. It's always a joy to be here and maybe give a little knowledge to everybody out there. I hope it helps people in some way. And until next time, as always, good luck and good trading for everybody. Thanks again, Larry. Thanks to you viewers for uh, being with us for this, uh, this time with Larry. And I uh, just want to remind everybody that we will finish the day with Jim Cagnina at bars closing 315 Eastern. Uh, and in the meantime, have a great trading afternoon and we'll see you there. Take care.